I'd invite you to uh, join us right in here so we can have a little more intimate uh, conversation. We, there's, we can, uh, with a small group, we can keep this really conversational. Uh, so feel free to shout or raise your hand or stand up when the Spirit moves you to do so. Um, our, our goal is, um, is to, to give you um, a, a quick deep dive into the work in Cajon, and then we'll, uh, we'll give David a chance to, um, we'll give him about 12 minutes on the, the backside to give you a little more detail about um, the work that he's done and, and some of the findings of his uh, new book. Is that good? All right. Ed, go. And I, unfortunately, I didn't bring you a clicker, so you may want to just stand there and um, okay. g give, us a, <laughs> give us a quick intro okay. to, uh, to the world of work. How many minutes, is, uh, how many minutes sir? Well, we have till 3.15, so okay. you, you can go till, let's call it 3, so you have like 20. Okay, 20 so minutes. So this is the 20 minute Fantastic. version. Fantastic, maybe we'll go, we'll go faster. And thank you so much for being here. It's a total honor to do this work. It wouldn't be happening without our board. Thank you so much, partners, just people. They, they really are good. Oh, the board's let me, amazing. Let me do a, sorry, I wanna, this, this really quick story. So David Miyashiro, who's this magical superintendent of this KA district, was uh, a turnaround principal. And he, he drove a, a pretty stellar turnaround of a, um, middle school, meaning he made the test scores much better. But when he got done, he thought to himself, we, we, didn't, um, we didn't really make the school better in ways that, we made it better for parents and authorizers and you know, policy makers, but not for kids. And he really stepped back and thought hard about the nature of work that he wanted to do. Is any of that accurate? It's 100% accurate. And they, it's really yeah. driven his community-based approach, having a conversation with the community about what do kids really need to know and be able to do uh, that has built support for this innovation agenda. So he's a, he's a super thoughtful, unassuming, um, humble guy that I, I think is, is behind the scenes on everything that you're going to hear about. Definitely. Definitely. I always say he's not prickly. So he's great at building relationships. Sometimes he can be. Al Bergman's here, and he's, I learned so much from Al. I'm so glad that you're here. He's at Harvard now, and just, he's amazing. Family community engagement started in Cone Valley because of one person, and it's Al Bergman. He taught me a lot. Because I'm three years into education, so I'm still learning about all the struggles. It's the hardest transition. I used to, when I was in staffing and human resources, they sent me to India to tell the vice presidents in these divisions that they weren't going to buy contingent labor the way they had always bought contingent labor. And let me tell you, those were hard conversations. Those were really hard conversations. This is way harder. <laughs> this is way harder. Um, yeah, this whole journey really has been a life journey. This is my hero. Dr. David Bluestein is my hero. Um, the work in vocational psychology, I was a terrible student, horrible student, very bad student. <laughs> and um, I often wondered as a kid, will I ever find my place in the world? And I'm so bad at math, and yet math is so important to the adults. Thank goodness for lacrosse and sports. Um, I went to a very privileged all-boys school down in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, but I always wondered, where, who, will ever, who would ever hire me? And I struggled through college, went to three colleges, that final two years, the University of Miami, public relations major, practical, hands-on doing. And I'm a pretty good at public speaking. And I got two years of straight A's. And I'm like, where did this come from? So I make it into the world of work. I fall into HR. And I realize that there's all these kids on these um, conveyor belts of education. They end up, like, we end up hiring them out of top universities to do software and hardware and everything else. And they're miserable in their jobs. And so in my 20% time project, we started career counseling practice for those folks. And we turned a lot of heads around that topic and that process. And we helped a lot of humans. I learned to have conversations with their managers about what they really want to be doing at work. And then we started adapting that for kids. And we created a makerspace called Think a Bit Lab. And we saw 15,000 students over three years. We taught them about the world of work. We helped them to code a little bit. And the superintendent said, can we do this instead of a one-day experience? Can we do this for every classroom? And I said, we should try that. So I left Qualcomm, which my wife wasn't thrilled about. Um, 
and I spent a year working on the theory of change and theory of action, and this is the result of that work. And really understanding the data in our region that we have more than 31,000 students that are 16, 24 years of age that are not in school and not working. They're opportunity youth. And uh, Dr. David Miyashiro, my superintendent, my CEO, um, he says, that's our fault. We failed those kids. And 19.5% of them have less than a high school diploma. So we talk about this data with teachers. They want to see the data. No one talks to them about the data, what's happening. They're just preparing kids for the next year. And we're saying, no, it's much bigger than that. So we show them the data about good jobs, Georgetown Center on Education and Workforce. 80% of the jobs are require some form of post-secondary education. Um, high school is no longer the finish line. Here's the data, we have all this data, and Andreas uh, Schleicher from OECD talks about this. We need to start earlier with students. We have to start earlier with students. We can't wait till high school. And so in Cajon Valley, they really understood this. And we had this modern curriculum in Cajon Valley. Um, our work is not supplemental or core. It's, it is core, it's not supplemental, it's not an add-on, it's not an extra. There's four core elements. And it's computer science, it's TED, TED, uh, TED Ed, so all of our kids are doing public speaking, there's little round circles, you can ask Gail about it in every classroom, and kids are doing TED Talks in first grade. Um, they're learning social emotional learning, right? Uh, positive relationship building. And then the world of work was this missing piece. How do we solve this problem for the path to gainful employment. This is our vision, it's right in our boardroom. Happy kids, healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. And so the theory of action, we won't spend any time on that, but there's some real clear reasons why we needed to move this work forward. And we just hadn't been doing it. I don't think I've met, met with a counselor. And I have a 17 and a 14 year old right now going through the process at an elite school in San Diego, and I'm really not allowed to speak there anymore <laughs> at this point. Um, they're clearly, one mission, get my son into whatever four-year college they can possibly get my child into. And I go, did we just not talk about Ryan Hidalgo? Why are we talking about University of Colorado or any of these other schools? Let's talk about the human that's right in front of you. And they just can't get that into their brains. And I wish he would go to a big picture school, but as I, kind of backtrack and think about all the research that hopefully some of you will be interested in exploring after this talk and maybe what you've learned about our work. I'm just so thankful by the, about the work and the community that Dr. Bluestein has been a part of for so many years because they've really informed our practice. When I say that this work is living and breathing is out there. There are, there are amazing vocational psychologists that are studying interests. They're studying possible selves, identity-based motivation, the theory of work adjustment. There are counselors, career counselors, who are doing this work, therapy for people who are struggling. And so our work is, is uh, what we call the mission of me. It's a three core process. And it's about helping every student, every grade, every year, discover who they are and who they want to become. We believe all of them should have a level of self-awareness, understand their strengths, interests, and values, get exposure to the world of work. We call it the journey. How does a child aspire to a career they don't know exists? and that each child can tell their story. Not someone else's story, not the pathway story, but their story. Do you, you do that in the two gen? Story? We do it in the two gen. We do the exact same thing for the parents. Parents are coming in, um, experiencing the exact same thing. We're using Holland, as we talked about earlier. Most research devolve vocational typologies. Um, you know, the impact of interest, the importance of interest. This is some of this research from James Rounds, University of Illinois, very recent. Why values? I mean, this is out here. We don't have to. I mean, we should keep studying it, but there's already research on this work that can inform our practice. So for our students, the, the idea is that every child, every grade, every year would explore careers, simulate them, have as-if experiences. Again, if it can be a BPL, leaving to learn, even better. Hard to do that in the early grades, hard to do that for 17,000 students. So we create those simulations in the classroom. Meet a pro, we use NEPRIS and practice that demonstration of learning. The Myers-Briggs Company is a great partner of ours as well. So here are the 54 experiences. Again, it's not about the job. These were sourced from the Strong Interest Inventory, which I consider one of the gold standards in career assessments. It's one of the tools that I use with students, parents, on the upper end of, of uh, the, the journey and exploration. Again, we don't want students to foreclose. We want them to have experiences in each of the RIASEC theme areas. We don't want them to say, well, I'm just realistic. I'm just going to have the realistic experience. No, we want you to go across all themes. And so our classrooms are transforming. The RIASEC is, is up on the wall. Students are 
aligning work to it. So say you're, you're working on a problem related to force in motion, the teacher might say, well, who from the world of work might we invite into our classroom to help us learn more about this topic of force in motion? Well, maybe it'd be someone who's investigative, people who like to use math and science to solve problems. Um, great answer. And the, How long would one of those 54 experiences be? It, it depends. It could be a week. It could be a couple days. It could be over um, several units, a couple months. It just depends. We allow the teachers to use their creative talent, teacher talents, uh, to make it happen. And some wonderful coaches that, that we've, we've brought on board. These were early adopters. They're now teaching other districts how to do this work. They're becoming career developers. They're understanding the language of Holland and, and other elements of the work. And so some big numbers. I mean, to achieve 69,000 student views of live industry chats with professionals through NEPRIS in two years, we couldn't have put all those students on, on yellow school buses and sent them out to the world of work. More than 9,000 assessments. Half of those are students, but the other half are parents and teachers. So our, our community is coming in and is learning the language. Uh, the, the Subaru dealer said, what if we take the Ryasek and we start categorizing different areas of work? Like the sales department should have the E, and, and we should put the R in the and so they're totally getting it, and they want to learn, which is just super fun. And the, the latest number, more than 2,000 parents have come through the process. So when, when parents ask, like, well, how is this really practical, the RIASEC in particular, I go, well, did you know that Oklahoma State and Ohio State and Arizona State classify their majors based on the RIASEC? They're like, that sounds pretty useful. And the ONET, the government's database of job, which, which most teachers have never heard of, um, classifies all the careers on the ONET based on the RIASEC. And the strong interest inventory classifies uh, the results, right? That gold standard career assessment based on the RIASEC. And here's TCC, Tallahassee Community College. They're aligning their pathways, both certificates and associate's degrees, by the RIASEC. So imagine for, for parents living in poverty, we talk about zip code destiny. AL knows their zip code destiny, right? You go look at the Opportunity Atlas and Raj Chetty's uh, Opportunity Atlas map. You look at Cajon Valley, it's red. Their zip code destiny is baked. No matter how great your pedagogy, your classroom experience, one-to-one, -one, everything else, they don't see the job at the Exxon station as transitory. Like, that's where it stops. Because they've never even seen the ocean before, and it's 15 miles away. So how do you tell a kid, when the parent can't even see it for themselves, that they can work at Qualcomm one day? And many of those kids that came to the Think of It lab, that was the first trip ever in an elevator. So how do you build hope for possible selves in a child when they can't see it? We're building it in the classroom, and we're making connections to Holland. And what's beautiful is that now our workforce board, WIOA funding, is now connecting to this. So these are our priority sectors in San Diego. I've sat on the workforce board for 10 years. It's kind of this cool marriage of workforce staffing and now education. They've aligned the priority sector careers to the RIASEC. So now we have this crazy cool continuum of conversation. And, um, and so our data is really cool stuff with the data. I won't show that, share those, but we're, we have the largest sample size of middle school student possible selves data ever, ever collected, thanks to Naja Fouad, who's an amazing researcher. And we're, but what I'm really excited about, is, and there's some crazy cool data there from the student perspective, but this is our, our teachers' um, belief and efficacy, how they're doing moving through those levels from year one to year two. So our teachers are growing in this practice. Um, they're believing in the practice, they're integrating it. And these, this is my favorite slide because here are teachers that believe that career development matters. There's our, gr our growth from year one to year two. The belief that teachers should play a role in career development and that, you know, there, there's, that it's improving the learning experiences, et cetera. So, You need the mic. No. Okay. There you go. Teachers, uh, teachers own it, like it, do it, get it. Thank you. Is Dr. Bluestein's uh, slides are next. You know where they are. Uh, before we transition, um, burning questions for Ed. Like, how does this work? How do you support it? Do you want to know how he implemented it? Do you want to have him say a couple words about that? Like, how, how in the world did you 
How'd you do it? What was the training like? Mm -hmm. What was, uh, okay. how'd you do that? That's a good question. Um, so when I was still a consultant at USD, <laughs> uh, they asked me to go and visit all 28 schools and to take the human through the process. Um, I wasn't very popular. So they, they did the assessments? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, it, essentially, we gave the gift of career development to the adults who had never gone through the process themselves. And they would raise their hands and say, no one's ever talked to me about my strengths, interests, and values. Because the teachers become independent contractors you know, in their own school, and they don't have one-on-ones with their principal because their principal's in the weeds. Um, so here, I was stepping in, having this conversation like, you're unique and special, you have strengths, and we, look, we talk the Gallup language around strengths, if you know Gallup. Interest, we talk RISEC, and values, we talk work adjustment. And so that's how we started it, and then we went big bang. We created product, everything, and put it out there and said, we don't expect you to um, do all the four levels of integration, we just expect you to tinker and try. And so um, two years into it, or three years into it now, we see the growth that I had on that other slide, and um, now we've actually built in this model into our LCAP, our local control funding, where all students are gonna learn about their strengths, interests, and values, and all students' work is gonna be connected to the world of work. Yeah, I, you know, we've, we've seen schools that have been brave and, and have created a set of shared values. This is the only place that I've seen where they, they're, they're um, asking kids to articulate their values. So I think it's a much more comfortable, in a super diverse community like diverse. A Cajon, um, not to impose a set of values, but to invite kids and families to articulate uh, their values and their growing sense of identity, I think is really uh, a beautiful approach. Oh, Andy. Yeah. So the part of the genius we're hearing from you, I think, uh, is the middle school orientation because what you're you're doing this at an age level that is before the really lockdown stuff happens on the part of both educators and parents who will say, yeah, I don't want you messing around with my kids, you know, test scores and, and chances of getting into Stanford and whatever else. So two questions. Uh, did you get any of that kind of pushback, even at the middle school level? And what's happening when the kids who are now leaving you to go to their area high schools and they're encountering that system, are they pushing and are those schools responding? Well, so we've just um, st we just applied to a, for a dependent charter um, to open up our own high school. Is no. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so um, when we went to our, our we have valley schools and rim schools, low SES in the valley, high SES on the rim. It's just the way people talk about it. Um, we, when we started taking the parents through um, in, on the valley schools. They, they, they would even try to articulate to you, thank you for doing this for my child. And they were almost projecting like, I can't do this for my child, but my school is. And parents that were homeless that would come and talk to us about this. And, and it's just heavy. And then you go up to, the, to one of the uh, RIM schools, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna put a lot more data into this presentation, <laughs> right? Because they drop their kids off and escalate, and it's just a different population. They had the same reaction to the experience. They said, th but they were more articulate. Thank you for doing this for my kids, and I wish I would have had this when I was their age, which is not what I was expecting. In fact, I was ready to bag out once and like, let's not take them through the exercise, I'm afraid. And my third grade teacher partner was like, no, we're doing it, we're doing it. We're gonna. And they didn't stop doing it. They wanted to keep doing the work. So they're all seeing the value of it, and I don't know if it's just the time is right in education because they're all freaked out about what school gonna cost and should they go to community college versus four year and this is how much and everything. The parents are freaked out right now. Like parents are hearing the, the conversations happening out there. But think about having this kind of experience K-8 so you can make a good decision about high school, like where to go to high school and yeah. if it's a career academy high school, which most kids have little or none of the kind of exposure that they've had. So they have, they not only have a lot of exposure to career opportunities, they have much better self-knowledge than is typical for middle school kids. David. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So um, 
the work that Ed is doing is just transformative, and it's it's hard to follow it it's up. Teachers, but, um, it's not me. <laughs> what I what I it, it is it is teachers, but it is you know somebody who's leading them. Um, so let me just give a, a few comments about the world of education and work, and provide a little bit of background on vocational psychology, and I'll end up with a discussion of some of my new work. So just for a little bit of background history-wise, vocational psychology, it's often thought to have started right here in Boston. Um, in 1909, a book was published called Choosing a, Choosing, a, um, Choosing a Vocation by Frank Parsons. And um, actually, if you go to the North End, if you a uh, great place for great Italian restaurants, there's a restaurant called La Familia Georgia. There's a plaque right on at the outset when you walk in that says this is the founding place of the, net, of the first Vocational Guidance Bureau. So Boston has an important place in the history of our field. Um, and the original model that Parsons developed, and Parsons was not a psychologist, there were very few psychologists at that period. He was a, a maverick social activist and he also ran for mayor of Boston. He was a populist in that era, not the kind of populist now that we hear about. Um, and this was an am amazing um, initiative and within three or four years, the of National Vocational and Guidance Association started. Ten years later, the first strong interest inventory was developed. So the country was ready for it. The world was ready for it. The current status is that it's a, the career development field is a very pluralistic field with different theories, different practices, narrative approaches. Um, there are different kinds of practitioners, anywhere from counseling psychologists to career coaches with career counselors, school counselors, providing a lot of the work in between. Um, and the basic focus of vocational psychology with relevance to this conference is um, trying to understand how people make decisions, how can we foster adaptive decisions, how do we help students to identify their identities, which does start with interests, values, and their own sense of themselves, and how can we help people to adapt to change which we discussed in the previous session. The, the issue of ongoing change is really endemic, and we do need to help our, our students across the lifespan understand and manage change as best they can. <clears throat> the relationship between education and work, I would call it uh, a complicated but enduring connection. I was gonna use some kind of marital metaphor, but I didn't think it would work. But it's, uh, it's an interesting, because actually one of the questions raised in the first in the earlier session was, is this focus on work going to diminish liberal arts? And that's a common question. People think about vocational education, career and technical education, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. Um, there's also a lot of misconceptions about people who don't go to four-year colleges. The United States is caught in a big conundrum around social class and status that I think gets played out in this conversation. And I think it's important for us to unpack those implicit um, conversations so that we're much more cognizant of what we mean by the relationship between education and work. <clears throat> One of the questions that I'm thinking over in my current research now is, what should education look like um, in 10 to 20 years? And if some of the predictions about a lot of lower level jobs being um, vanishing and the jobs being taken over by automation are true, <clears throat> how will we motivate and engage students if 10, 20, or 30 percent will be um, working sporadically, relying on basic income guarantees? What will their lives look like? What will it mean for education? This is a question that um, in some research I'm doing with my colleague Dennis Shirley, we haven't found a lot of people who are thinking about this seriously. So this is an important point in ter terms of the education work nexus. Another important point is how do we ensure we're educating the whole child? As I responded earlier, I think the um, focus on work and career does not diminish and ought not to diminish the focus on individuals and their well-being and their capacity to engage in a meaningful, purposeful life and engage in relationships that are meaningful and purposeful. In the psychology of working framework and theory that I developed in the last 15 or 20 years, I've talked about work as a means of survival. I've also talked about it as a means for social connection and contribution and for self-determination because this is an abridged presentation. I'll focus just on survival, oh, survival and self-determination. So um, first off, we know that the future of work, the present of work, is complex and uncertain. 
I've argued in my new book particularly that work is part of our DNA. It's part of how we evolved as human beings. We were, in, our task of engaging in survival was really the antecedents of work. Um, people didn't get up in the morning and think, what are we gonna have for dinner tonight? They had to go out and figure it out every single day. And that is part of what helped us to evolve. It's also part of what has helped us to um, create this sense of responsibility of, of doing tasks, of engaging in projects. <clears throat> so another question that we need to look at in terms of survival is how will educators ensure that students <clears throat> have skills to manage an uncertain world and are creative and critical cit citizens to advocate for a decent work and for a decent society? Should have had a decent society in there. But um, the last few years of our political system have certainly underscored the the fact that education, I think, has failed our citizens um, in terms of preparing for uncertain work worlds and also failed in terms of how to manage diversity, how to manage, I think somebody mentioned implicit biases in the first, in the earlier session, how to manage some of these difficult issues that are being really kind of manipulated by um, particular political ideologies. We need to help people learn how to manage that. Uh, work as a means of self-determination. This is the kind of traditional career development narrative, people finding meaning and purpose in their lives, doing something that they love, passion, purpose. I'm a big fan of this. I will say that in my, in my own community of counseling and vocational psychologists, people often think I don't care about this because I focus so much on survival. And um, I'm happy that I have focused on survival because very few people have focused on it in the current era, in both in education and in psychology. Um, <clears throat> so how do we find a balance between survival needs and self-determination needs? This is an ongoing struggle that human beings have to deal with. And how will this balance be affected by unknown changes in the world of work? Someone raised earlier, we don't know what the future holds, and that is totally accurate. I've actually stopped reading all these predictions because I think, we're, as somebody noted, we're living it right now, and we have to be aware of what the, what the deficits are in our work lives, because they're here right now. Um, so the future of work and education, this was a cover of the New Yorker magazine about three years ago. A lot of you probably remember it, because it was it's a very, for me, it was like a remarkable cover about uh, the future of the world <clears throat> with robots walking around with their lattes. I guess they have coffee there, and human beings as the um, homeless people. It's kind of a sad future. Um, but some of the questions we need to think about in terms of the future of work and education, should we be serving the marketplace? Do we serve the broader good? These are ongoing debates in education. I think we absolutely need to serve the broader good, and I actually have some questions that I'm mulling over in an article I'm working on now about STEM career development, and um, it's very unpopular for people to take that on in my field. I gave a talk on, uh, at the American Psychological Association conference raising questions about the focus, the such an exclusive focus on STEM, and the pushback I received was intense. So I went back to the drawing board, spent another six months on this article, and it's almost ready to be submitted. Um, but I think we need to start thinking about um, who, gets a ch who values the work that people do. Yes, there's a need for technology, and technology is totally pervasive in our world, but there's a tremendous need for caregiving work. There's a tremendous need for people to take care of each other. And um, we see this. We've, we, those, those roles have been remarkably diminished in our views of work and occupations and careers. Um, we also need to serve children and adults across the lifespan. So. In my view, and I hope it's um, a humble view, I, I feel like it's a very humble view, I do think the psychological study of work, career development, vocational psychology is critical to a, uh, a vision of a decent, decent work and also a decent society. In terms of next steps, I think our goals in this field are to understand this age of uncertainty, and I um, will just give a brief plug here from my book, um, which is, was written as a book that ideally would be relevant to the broad public. I didn't write it exactly as a trade book. 
I wrote it as an academic book with a crossover appeal. I call it a hybrid book. Um, some folks here have read it, which I'm pleased about. Um, so um, in this book, the book is based on interviews that my students and I conducted with 58 people across the country, very in-depth interviews, heart-wrenching interviews, and some full of joy and accomplishment. The book does have a depressing cover. I presented it to my colleagues at the Lynch School of Education and Human Development, and one of my colleagues said, David, why does this book look so depressing? Your whole talk was depressing. I said, okay, I've got to lighten this presentation up. It's not ultimately a depressing book. Ultimately, it's a hopeful book, helping people to gain the awareness, deep, deep awareness and knowledge about what it means to be, to work in the world and how work functions to help us feel truly alive in the world. And it does map, um, um, it does provide a map of how we can improve work for all and improve our society to ensure that there's decent work for all. So if you're interested, there's a flyer here. I'm also going to have a meet and greet at the Boston, Col Boston College Lynch School of Education and Human Development has a table, and I'll be there after the session's over to talk to anybody who wants to chat further. Well, thank you. Thanks, David. Awesome. Question for David? <clears throat> I, one thing I like about his book is that it's both, it's really personal, like he invites people to be kind and thoughtful and generous as individuals, um, but, but he also um, wades into the policy um, in environment and acknowledges that we're living in a period where uh, we are going to have to build a set of collective solutions that make society work for everyone. Um, I've been struck recently by the need for more um, mutuality, the fact that climate change and both the benefits and threats of uh, artificial intelligence, these are shared. These are things, these are threats and, and opportunities that we share and that maybe the, the, the biggest intersection between climate change and AI is that we're gonna have to find, invent, build new ways to share uh, both the, the benefits and the burdens uh, of each of those things. And, it, and I think in Europe and Scandinavia that in some respects they'll um, do that more readily than in the United States. So I, I do worry about the United States and our ability to, in communities and states, and certainly at the federal level, to build sharing mechanisms that are thoughtful. I think we'll see cities be the places where solutions emerge, but any other thoughts on the, uh, on the collective aspects of how we make, create more opportunity for more people? Well, first of all, I want to underscore this point of, uh, of mutuality and, and care. It's very important. I was very pleased to hear you say that this morning. Um, oops, I wonder if people couldn't hear me. Uh, I'll just use this. So um, I do think that's really critical. In terms of public policy recommendations, I think that we need a, a systemic and planned approach to work. Oh, dear. Um, somebody doesn't agree. Um, he, doesn't needs, like, he doesn't like universal basic income. Uh, universal basic income, this person, well, we, I think we will need universal basic income, but we really need more than that, um, a way to improve the quality of work for people, right. to restore labor unions, to think about other kinds of work organizations and to provide protections, social protections, economic protections. This is critical part of the ILO's decent work agenda, and it has not been part of the deregulatory state that the United States embraced in the 1980s. So, There's clearly gonna to have to be stronger social safety nets, and I, I guess one optimistic opportunity that I've written a little bit about is the social economy, that there's the opportunity to better value the contributions that we make to others. If you're an early childhood worker or you work with senior citizens, how can we better um, capture the value that you're contributing to society and, yeah. and monetize that? I think that's part of um, this new social economy. My question is right along with that for 
either of you actually, uh, the stigma that's around certain jobs and why is that? For example, a plumber comes into your home. That plumber knows things and can do things for you that you can't do and you're relying on them just like a doctor. On the other hand, because they're coming into your house, maybe there's a stigma that the, the work, that their position is lower than yours in some way. Has there been some talk, research about how we can get rid of these stigmas in people's minds? This feels uh, stronger in the U.S. than it is in other countries that I visit. I, I don't get that sense in Europe or uh, in Scandinavia, but... I, I, can you hear me with this? Yes. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the stigma is very pervasive in the U.S. Um, it's interesting about coming into homes. It's interesting that doctors don't, don't do house calls anymore. But doctors used to do house calls. Um, it's a big issue, the, the, the denigration of tradespeople. I think that's going to... Um, have to end because I think what's going to happen is we will continue to need tradespeople and some of the white collar jobs are going to disappear and are disappearing already, whereas the trades are still very vibrant in many sectors. Okay, really quick. Yeah, uh, just as a comment uh, to that question, I would actually look into the literature on a political economy, like Kath Kathleen Thielen, for instance, has been writing a lot about this at MIT. I, um, like she probably has uh, some answers, but a uh, question. Um, then actually to, to you, um, bringing in uh, Dan's comments about you know, rights and, and unions, et cetera, is that something that you teach in your schools to your children, you know, that work is, is appreciated in different ways and that there is you know, a way to demand things from your employers, say? Most definitely. I think that even... You um, both get 20 seconds, go. Yeah, helping teachers with the language of dignity in all work has gone a long way. And that is being... Um, deployed in the classrooms, but it, it's become very natural to understand and appreciate all the people that serve even our school, our custodians, our mechanics. When we started with our NEPRS chats, our Meet Pro chats, we started with our mechanics and our food service, because we 22,000 meals a day. We started high, by highlighting them, our own employees, and so that really started to generate this language around dignity and all work. Thank you. Just last quick comment is uh, what I love about Cone Valley is their commitment to community and the fact that they, they're they in a conversation with their community about the world of work and their community told them to value um, all work. Uh, and I think they, you've really taken that to heart yeah. that all work has value, all people have value. Um, so anyway, I appreciate that. That's part of how they built support um, for the work that they do. Anyway, thank our uh, guests for another stimulating conversation. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.